Hello students, it gives me a great pleasure to introduce our resource person of, for today, Miss Nikita Tavhan. Huh? The TY students already know her, uh, but I will introduce her uh, for our FY and SY students. Uh, she was our past student and she, she completed her MA last year only. And uh, from last year, immediately after completing her MA, she started teaching our Modi class here. Hmm? She is also our resource person. She is also one of our resource persons for our Brahmi and Modi classes. Ami jata suru rahotna, you must be knowing. Huh? Brahmi and Modi class la, shikonara lukan peki ekti ahe, and there are other four persons also. And uh, Taral, Rohit Taral of SY knows. Huh? So, and she has, uh, she also taught Brahmi to TY students some, some time back. Uh, so she gave a very nice workshop and she's very thorough, whatever she does, she's very thorough with. And uh, I have just introduced you to the concept of maritime. Maritime history means what I have told you. I have told you that maritime means what I have told you. I have told you that marina beach was there. So maritime means samudra, but samudra means the history of deep sea. So that's why kai kai yeta, you just hear it from Madam herself. So I request Nikita Madam, Nikita Chauhan Madam, to start her lecture. Thank you, ma'am, for your kind words for me. Uh, I'm Nikita Chavan and uh, today I'm uh, going to speak on the topic of Marit India's maritime history specifically. So first of all, uh, I would like to share uh, my experience, like why I took this subject when I was doing my uh, master's uh, in history. So uh, when I was doing my, my MA, so uh, in fourth semester, I had this subject, uh, India's maritime history. So initially, I didn't have any idea what is maritime history or what is uh, ocean and sea. like how we connect sea to history because uh, when we were in school uh, we had uh, taught about the uh, geography and sea like we could connect these things geography and sea geography and ocean but it sounds different when we connect seas to history okay so again this is new topic or uh, not new but we are not aware like there is a uh, there is such kind of perspective on uh, like we could study on this okay share my knowledge what i have studied throughout my ma course okay so now i'll present so today we will just uh, specifically uh, talk about the india's maritime history okay so uh, first of all uh, as a history student uh, even you should know about there are many perspectives to while studying while we are studying the history like uh, nowadays history is not that uh, kind of like um, limited topic or like uh, just limited to the wars or just limited to the battles or not it's not just limited to the just mugging up the dates of that uh, wars uh, and all but it has so many perspectives like uh, if uh, uh, i would like to name some uh, perspectives like imperialist studies are there then marxist studies are there in the history then uh, there is a uh, subaltern history uh, is there in, while we are studying history like um, subaltern history like uh, when we studied the uh, history of the depressed classes then there is a women's history uh, nationalist history so there are many perspectives while we are studying uh, history as a subject okay so again uh, like this like this uh, these perspectives we have uh, india's maritime history like maritime studies um, so basically uh, maritime studies means uh, the activities or the studies related to the oceans and seas uh, can you tell me um, you have heard the uh, statement or you have you heard about the 
sentence like seventy uh, percent of our Earth's surface is covered with water. No, like we have studied in this geography when when we are in school. Okay, so basically, uh, most of the time, uh, what we do is uh, we just focus on the uh, land surfaces, or uh, we just ignore the seventy percent of that seeds uh, on. Uh, Uh, which is covered with the blue share okay so uh, now what you have to do is just change your the way you see the world map by focusing your attention on the blues that uh, shade the 70% of the uh, image okay okay so the maritime history maritime history or the maritime studies is uh, associated with the activities related to the oceans and seas okay so the what are these activities uh, related to the oceans and seas so we can say uh, sea trade uh, sea trade routes then uh, while uh, we are doing any trade through the sea route uh, we just uh, use the ports and harbors so studying these things then a uh, ship <coughs> while voyagers or sea traders use which kind of ships while they are uh, going for the trade uh, so basically while studying the maritime history we just have to uh, we just not focus on the just seas and oceans but we uh, also study the other aspects uh, the other uh, activities related to the seas and oceans like trade trade routes then uh, ports harbors and uh, so on and so forth uh, maritime history of india is enormous and comprehends several eras like right from the uh, indus valley civilization uh, until even now current uh, era uh, india has rich maritime heritage which covers the uh our indian culture our philosophy and other things so before the airways or uh, before the introduction of uh, airways uh, there was only a sea transportation for the long voyages okay uh, so sea transportation and obviously road transports was there but sea transports were was convenient okay uh, for uh, traders merchants who engage in these activities okay so that's why sea transportation was important even now sea transportation and uh, study of seas is that uh, is important okay have you got about the basic idea like what is maritime history what is, what is the study of uh, seas and oceans if you have got that. yes ma'am no. okay so i'll move on to the next slide now we will see why like uh, why maritime study or why this uh, studying oceans and seas are important like uh, before this uh, even my experiences like that uh, before the studying uh, this maritime history as a research point of view uh, i only knew that uh, our writers and poets only just romanticize the seas through their writings and poems and all but again the, uh, the seas and oceans obviously it has an it, it has a importance too many importance so now we will see new knowledge first point is new knowledge why it is important so for example if um, i am a art i am an artist okay uh, for example i am an uh, i am a painter so uh, i am uh, traveling from one point to another point and i am taking my that knowledge to another point so obviously it's a carrying or it's a traveling of the of that knowledge to the one point from other another point so obviously um, while studying maritime uh, history new knowledge is important or okay so travel of new no, new knowledge then second point is cartography cartography is uh, related to the maps so basically cartography is uh, it's a science of graphically representing a geographical area 
usually uh, usually on flat surfaces like uh, in short in simple words uh, cartography is making a map so obviously while making a map uh, it's not just important to show the land surfaces obviously we have to show the sea routes or uh, how the uh, area is covered how many uh, part is covered with sea okay so obviously cartography and the study of maps is also important uh, third point is geography obviously while uh, geography uh, studying history uh, geography and history both are social sciences okay and both these both subjects are interrelated uh, geography and chronology are two eyes of history so obviously chronology as we know like dating of uh, any incidents so uh, while studying history like dating is important uh, as well as geography is also important um uh, so if, for example i know about the french revolution okay but if i don't know where french revolution has happened then what's the point no if i can't locate that area on map so obviously uh, geographical information or our geographical uh, knowledge is as important as our historical knowledge so um, in maritime studies obviously it is important while you are showing any port or you are showing any uh, sea trade routes geography knowledge of geography is important then fourth point is navigation so navigation basically it means that uh, knowledge of direction uh, like nowadays for direction or for navigation uh, what do we use what kind of technology we use can anyone answer now yeah like techno savvy people no so for navigation so GPS, we have GPS, then we have Google Maps in our phones, no? So, uh, we need navigation uh, when, when we, when, whenever we are traveling. So, uh, in ancient period or in medieval period, when this kind of technology was not there, uh, so uh, basically these voyagers who, uh, who traveled uh, through the sea routes, uh, in ships, they have kind of a machine, uh, like compass, uh, we can say, which which they use for uh, directing or uh, just for which uh, that that kind of machine that uh, which uh, for from with the help of that machine they can uh, n uh, know that where they are traveling. Okay, okay so navigation instead of in early period obviously the these voyagers also use the science of astrology okay uh, it it is also important while uh, they just uh, with the help of uh, position of stars they can uh, use the uh, or they can tell where they are going so obviously the science of navigation or the science of direction then another point last point is ethnography so basically ethnography is the scientific description of peoples and cultures with their customs habits and mutual differences like uh, uh, when i'm traveling if uh, from india to the another western country or any other country before that i should know or i should have that knowledge which kind of uh, culture that, that people possess okay so any uh, anywhere we are going uh, we should know the we should have the knowledge of that people the living of people the way in which way they are living their food habits their culture okay so and because of that because of these things uh, it's like uh, knowledge of maps knowledge of geography then directions and ethnography uh, 
inclusively these points or these uh, areas of knowledge uh, are important while we are while we are studying the maritime uh, history or any uh, study of seas study of ocean okay so this is just a basic study of maritime history now i'll just move on to the main topic uh, for which we are here india's maritime history like maritime studies are vast subject so i am just uh, focusing on the india's maritime history okay so obviously uh, you all have you all have idea about the uh, map of india obviously but many a times what we do is uh, we just neglect this part or this portion of our map and we just focus on this land plateaus and mountains and all okay so basically uh, the indian ocean so this part this blue part is indian ocean the indian ocean covers at least at least 1/5 of the world's total ocean area okay and how it is bounded so it is bounded with bounded by africa and the arabian peninsula see on west coast on west coast we have arabian sea so it is bounded by africa and arabian peninsula known as the western indian ocean so this part is western indian ocean then uh india's coastal waters means this part on the south of the below the sri lanka okay so the coastal waters is the central indian ocean and this on the right hand side the bay of bengal near myanmar and indonesia we have the eastern indian ocean okay so obviously this part is important while we are uh, studying the maritime we should know uh, like india is bounded with large part of uh, our land is bounded with the uh, ocean okay and collectively this uh, part this known we we could name it as indian ocean okay arabian sea bay of bengal and central indian ocean now i'll move on okay uh, have you heard about peninsula or peninsular region i know it's a new term for you even i didn't know this like i have heard about the uh, sometimes we call india as a indian peninsula and all but uh, most of the time we don't know why we call india as a indian peninsula or peninsular country so basically the term peninsula means uh, when a land form is surrounded by water on the majority of its border so if again you can see here large part of india is bounded by the sea or bounded by the water that's why we call india as a indian peninsula okay so again that's what uh, that's what i told you uh, indian peninsula is surrounded by arabian sea on the west so can you tell me on uh, mumbai has which uh, sea uh, we belong to which coast arabian sea no on mumbai yes. yeah and uh, maharashtra uh, we have a uh, 720 km of uh, coastal uh, uh, region or that part is covered with the sea okay then on west we have arabian sea bay of bengal on the east and the indian ocean on the south this is arabian sea this is central indian ocean and this is bay of bengal so obviously um uh, as i said it provides critical sea trade routes that connect the middle east so because of this uh, ocean this sea the sea uh, it connect we we could connect to the middle east to the africa and to the south asia with the border asian uh, with the broader asian continent to the east and europe to the west okay so this route as like overland route, uh, routes are important uh, like that we we like that uh, it is also important to know the sea trade routes or sea routes so on this slide what i have showed here on the map 
that is okay uh, the term peninsula indian peninsula is uh, got it with these uh, terms why we call india as peninsular land peninsular country so basically we can uh, we can just divide this uh, eras or divide this period as early period then uh, medieval period and obviously a uh, modern period when the europeans entered in the uh, indian maritime activities okay so in early period we had uh, we didn't have in at initially uh, we just have that uh, archaeological uh, archaeological uh, sites or uh, which archaeologists have found on the basis of that we could say that india has uh, india is and has always been a maritime nation with a strong links to the seas and obviously it has a rich heritage and history spanning more than 5000 years ago okay while we are studying this maritime history it is important to know that that maritime heritage however it is need to look beyond merely historical facts to many other aspects like we have both tangible and intangible uh, sources for on the basis of that we can study our um, maritime history so it has extended to the tangible aspects like so we have tangible uh, aspects such as archaeological excavation sites so this is just a painting of archaeological site uh, which is known as lothal um while uh, excavating the site of uh, harappan civilization uh, now this site is in gujarat okay on the western coast um so archaeological sites then revealing ports and dockyards artifacts seals and sculptures inscriptions we have then we have literary references depicting our maritime relations with distant lands okay so obviously india uh, has always engaged in uh, maritime activities since the uh, indus valley civilization hmm so this is first example from or this is the first archaeological site uh, from on the basis of which archaeologists are saying that uh, um, indian maritime activities are not uh, new or obviously it is uh, spans literally 5000 years back hmm so this is the world's first tidal dock Uh, so it is believed to have been built at lothal uh, you must have heard about this uh, indus valley or uh, harappan civilization site lothal so it is dates back to the 2300 bce okay um, and it is belongs to the indus valley civilization uh, now present day it is at mangrol harbor on the gujarat coast okay so basically uh, this is a dock kind of structure we can say so what are the docks this is new term maybe for you okay so docks we can say um, it is a enclosed areas where berthing of the ships uh, happens and like it is a kind of structure where ships can a uh, st ships could stop on that uh, area on that spot and uh, on that area the ships to keep them afloat at a uniform level and uh, to facilitate loading and uploading of cargo okay so it's a cargo kind of a structure where ships you you can see here ships are just of on the coast of that area okay so in current days we have many docks we have many ports okay uh, so just to give an example so you can relate this what kind of this place was so now a days we have bhausa dakka you must have heard about this place at uh, it is at the gateway of india bhausa dakka or princess dock so it is a kind of a dock bhausa dakka or we can or it is also known as ferry wharf is mumbai's biggest fish market obviously it is known as fish market 
uh, it is near to the gateway of india and it is a dockyard from where ferries connect to the alibag uh, i think you have visited this place so you can relate bhausa dakka to this our ancient site uh, of the lothal have you understood what is the dock if you don't understand anything you can ask me huh? you say that just yeah it's yes yes dock means uh, we can also write uh, like uh, an, an enclosed area where uh, ships stop and where uh, car cargo yeah. and move in and out of the ship we can write like this also na huh? yeah it's a kind of a, a place where uh, is where uh, loading and uploading uh, happens okay uh, or we can say uh, we have ports no airports where uh, flights uh, come and go departure and exits like that okay so it's kind of that where ships can stop here okay so obviously in this slide also there india has a rich maritime history 5000 years back and this is the first tidal dock which uh, archaeologists have found even from uh, indus valley civilization civilization we have found the many seals many pots many uh, coins uh, on which uh, ships or uh, on which the picture of ships engraved on it or obviously from this archaeological uh, evidences we can say that uh, india was engaged or indian people were engaged in this uh, sea activities from very beginning period so initially obviously uh, the indian people were uh, engaged in sea uh, maritime activities just for trade okay It's just for trade purpose they were not uh, focusing on uh, any uh, uh, see uh, the security of the coastal areas or anything like that okay so basically trade was one of the significant mainstays of the harappan era and many excavations has, uh, have proven this fact like uh, as i said before so stone seals from that period established the small flat bottomed boats and large ocean going ships okay so in ships also there are different uh, kind of ships okay for small voyages we have small boats and for long distance we have big uh, ship or big, we have big cruise kind of structure okay even uh, ship building and ship breaking is another aspect in maritime studies so now after the archaeological uh, sites uh, we will move on the what literary records or uh, literary evidences we have found so after the uh, prehistoric era after the indus valley civilization uh, we have many written records uh, like scholars rather scholars have found many written records on the basis of which uh, we have many uh, things to say that obviously indians were there in the maritime activities so first of all in rigveda so rigveda uh, mentions rigved mentions the merchants who crowd the great waters and ships so basically merchants again merchants means uh, traders uh, obviously who used to just carry the trade to the sea route hmm. so from this we can say that obviously uh, literary literary records also says that boat making and ship building uh, ship building industries uh, were found in india since ancient times of okay in vedic period sea was frequently used for trade purposes obviously in rigveda it also mentions merchants who crowd the great waters and ships on on this statement we we could believe uh, on this statement and we could uh, analyze through this that uh, vedic period was sea was frequently used for the trade purposes specifically for trade purposes hmm. then 
next thing we have manus okay so the manu story was it's a story from indian hindu mythology i can say not uh, indian mythology hindu mythology so manu uh, was a first man according to hindu mythology manu was a first man uh, even you can relate this stories uh, story to the story of noah's ark from bible okay so the basically this in the story of manu what happens uh, at the time of flood when pralaya uh, was uh, जो हा प्रलय होता एट द टाइम ऑफ फ्लड विष्णु लॉर्ड विष्णु इंस्ट्रक्टेड मनु दैट यू बिल्ड यू बिल्ड अ शिप और अ बोट एंड फिल इट विथ एनिमल्स एंड सीड्स to repopulate the earth okay so uh, at the time of flood what manu uh, did is he just built a boat and uh, he take uh, some creature some animals with him and he just repopulate or he just uh, take that boat and uh, travel or uh, just go through the uh, go to the another place uh, and with this uh, another place means Ma- malaya mountain okay according to the hindu mythology he travel to the mountain malaya okay and uh, he again repopulate there um, so basically uh, from this story what we can say even our hindu mythology mentions the uh, use of boats and use of ships okay then we have kautilya's arthashastra so in kautilya arthashastra he has mentioned that the admiralty figures as a separate department of the war office so basically admiralty nothing but a, it's a navy like now we have in indian force we have a uh, indian army then we have indian air force and indian navy just like that uh, according to the uh, kautilya arthashastra uh, in that period they have uh, they had the navy as a different department of the war office hmm. <clears throat> then in mahabharat in uh, shanti parva it is said that the navy is one of the angas one of the part of the complete army uh, see we didn't uh, know these kind of things like uh, even uh, when i was doing my uh, studies uh, initially i only knew the uh, like maratha navy was just uh, just like i had only idea about the maratha navy but obviously we have uh, in ancient period we have navy, but not that strong or uh, not that uh, capable but obviously there are uh, some literary sources which we can co- we could rely on these literary sources hmm. so even uh, arthashastra in kautilya's arthashastra there is a ship building also the mention of ship building okay so he says that uh, he mention about the large boats means mahanava then uh, it provided with captain okay uh, and other another other men in the in that ship okay so we knew or indians were new to the or they had the knowledge of ship building boat making obviously without which we can't go through the sea voyages now or we can't do the sea trade or something like that so basically we need ships we need boats for these uh, activities to carry these activities then another work uh, which is by king bhoj from malwa another literary record uh, written evidence which is named as the yukti kalpataru which is um, compiled by raja bhoj bhoj narapati he has a uh, so in this 
written record or in this written evidence uh, raja bhoj mentioned about the another uh, kind of thing like a uh, ship building then what he says in the yukti kalpataru basically so it is a treatise which gives a technocratic exposition on the techniques of ship building like how uh, in that period how they they built ship how uh, uh, which material they used okay then it also provide minute details on various types of ships okay there were uh, even nowadays we have uh, various types of ships okay uh, then their sizes along with materials from which they were built uh, like uh, in initial uh, stages we just used the wood like local wood like uh, jackfruit uh, wood or uh, which is strong uh, which is considered as strong okay then uh, mango tree wood so these woods were uh, initially in initial stages we use these woods to build ships okay in even in medieval period shivaji used the these kind of woods to build their ships then yukti kalpataru sums up in condensed form all the available information apart from describing the quantities of the different types of wood their suitability in ship building uh, yukti kalpataru also gives an elaborate classification of ships okay so again ships also classified on the basis of their sizes so he gave uh, primary uh, information about the classification of ships so the primary divisions uh, were in two classes primary division of ships were in two classes uh samanya means ordinary and vishesh means special uh I, according to me or uh, even uh, just i can see that samanya means it's just for uh, ordinary it could be uh, in ordi for ordinary uh, voyages through the sea and uh, vishesh special may be for uh, higher class people that's what i think okay then the ordinary type was for sea voyages and ships that undertook sea voyages were classified again that ships which uh, undertook sea voyages again it classified into dirgha type of ship dirgha which had a long and narrow hull okay hull means a anchor okay so just uh, if you want to stop something that ship so you can use that hull okay so dirgha type of ships which had a long and narrow hull and the unnata type of ships which had a higher hull okay so basically we can say that yukti kalp yukti kalpit yukti kalpataru is a treatise uh, or compilation of treatises in which uh, the raja bhosh has mentioned about the ship building then techniques of ship building okay we have seen uh, now the archaeological evidences even the written records again there was we have found some sanskrit terms sanskrit terms in some uh, in some works okay so here we are a compass uh, which i have mentioned the it's a machine to use or uh, to show the direction when you are traveling through the sea hmm. a compass uh, which was known as a matsya yantra okay in sea or uh, i think you have you must have seen and seen this in movie or something they show in the in ships they carry this kind of machine okay compass kind of structure okay so it's a matsya yantra uh, was used for navigation to use um, to show the direction okay then the word navigation itself is derived from the sanskrit word navagati or navagati okay uh, the word navy is also de derived from sanskrit nau nau means a uh, ship okay now or we can say then there were sanskrit terms for many parts of ships too okay so the ship's anchor was known as navabandhan keela 
which literally means a nail to tie a ship if uh, like nowadays we have or for bikes or uh, for uh, bicycles we have that stand to park that bicycle no so to park this ships this boats we have anchor kind of a structure okay uh, and in sanskrit we can know uh, we could term it as a nava bandhan keel a nail to tie a ship if you want to you want to park or you want to stop that ship on the uh, on somewhere in a on a coast so you can park it the sail was called vata vastra which means wind cloth then the rudder was called keni pata pata means blade okay so your we have many such sanskrit terms then the ship's keel was called navatala which means bottom of ship okay so in these literary records in these written uh, documents we have found the sanskrit terms for the many parts of ships okay even nowadays these words have many terms are derived from this uh, original sanskrit words so basically these evidences shows that maritime activities in the post harappan civilization uh, indicates strong trade ties between india and the world obviously uh, after, even uh, in the during the indus valley civilization and after that period uh, when we will move on when when we will see the how the ashoka or how the other dynasties engaged in the maritime activities okay so during this period various empires ruling the indian subcontinent okay uh, and also they uh, they engaged in different kind of maritime uh, maritime activity so first of all i'll like to tell you about the magads okay the magads led by king bimbisara of the dynasty so were among the first to rise maritime prominence after defeating the king of vanga Uh, acquiring control over the sea in the east okay so they began to trade with southeast asia so we had the um, maritime active or the trade relations good trade relations with southeast asia with uh, other with the western world okay so this is the uh, on this slide you can see here is the coin which belongs to the satvahana dynasty this coin is vashishta putra pulumai's coin okay so on this coin you can see there is a ship kind of structure okay there is a ship okay and this is just a one example uh, from which we can say uh, satvahanas or the the king the contemporary uh, dynasties or contemporary these kings engaged in the maritime activities so the on this uh, coin there is a picture of ship there is a floating ship on the sea okay uh, we have uh, archaeologists have found this n number of coins okay from the western coast or, or from overall india okay so in the early period many kingdoms like the cholas the cheras and the pandas on the south coast of india uh, so these powers were dominant powers of the peninsular india um, and were called the muventar so muventar which literally translate to the the three crowned kings okay so these kings or these dynasties were prominent uh on the south coast of india uh, so what they did uh, so the, the chola dynasty had the maximum impact on the maritime domain uh, they helped the tamil merchants uh, merchants again uh, i can say traders so the they helped tamil merchants uh, merchant guilds to expand into the southeast asia again so these uh, these merchants these traders were engaged with, in the trade with the many western countries uh, many uh, other countries from the southeast asia then and say as trade relations between india and the greco roman world amounted a larger degrees spices so the main 
uh, commodities or the main uh, materials they used to import and export the spices became the main import from the india to the western world uh, leaving behind the silk and other commodities so obviously silk then uh, other commodities were there uh, they just used to ex uh, import and export from the tra sea trade routes for these uh, uh, for the sea trade for for the trade purposes they used uh, sea or uh, trade routes from so this is the famous silk route okay so just ignore this red part okay this is the overland silk trade route but just see you can see here there was a maritime silk trade route which connects india with you can see here on west on you with the europe with the china and other many continents okay so this is the, the uh, with they used this sea trade route this silk route uh, to carry the their trade so in this time the chola we can say cholas were prominent uh, in the south so the chola military was well organized okay and effective fighting force uh they used uh, they used to carry small battles not huge we can say because they were mainly engaged in the uh they were mainly engaged in the trade purposes but still they uh, also focused on navy too so the chola navy played a pivotal role in the expansion of the chola empire so it was instrumental in the cholas conquest of the ceylon island uh so they could from this they could uh, spread hinduism they also encourage spread of dravidian culture and architecture architecture to the southeast asia okay so they played active role uh, curbing the piracy again piracy is another thing uh, like piracy or uh, samudri lutere we can say from the, these sometimes these sea voyagers there are uh they just uh, they just looted or they just uh, they troubled other voyagers okay so that is a sea piracy it's another again it's another aspects in the maritime studies okay piracy and all so the chola navy is full force as it arrives at the malaya peninsula carrying warriors and towering war elephants so during the time of raja raja chola 1 uh, and his son rajendra chola 1 it is said that the chola navy had more than 1 million naval soldiers see 1 mil more than 1 million naval soldiers even uh, in the ancient india uh, you can't neglect the ashoka so what he did he sent his he sent his son and daughter to the uh, another to the another country to, to just um, spread the ideas or the thoughts of buddhism to just spread the uh, religion or uh, his thoughts okay uh, and so for that also the, he used the uh, sea route so on the southern coast of india so this is the replica of the ship uh, it is um, it belong to the again chola period now this replica is in the government of government museum in the tamil nadu so obviously this is the evidence that evident that the cholas or the southern powers um used these uh, ships and boats to carry the sea trade so the cholas in time of the uh, during the time of cholas uh, in ancient india they became the leading naval power beginning with the again raja raja 1 uh, so he triumphed over the fleet of the kala shekhara king bhaskara Ravi Varman one Chola kings did overseas expeditions to the Sri Lanka and Southeast Asia. Okay, so for these purposes, Chola were prominent in the maritime activity. Okay, so the now I'll move on after the ancient after the uh, Hindus and the ancient uh, Hindu kings and Indian kings were prominent in the. uh indian old maritime activities uh so they 
देर वॉज अ मिथ और देर वॉज अ सुपर स्टेशन आई कैन से दैट इफ एनी वन पास इज द सी ओके और सो ही विल he will lose the uh, he will lose the his or her indianness there was a myth okay so i think because of this superstition if you lo- uh, if you pass the seas sir ka sat samudra par kele tar tumhi punha ithe tumhala ithe parat ghetla janar nahi tumcha dharmat ghetla jan asa ek myth hota so because of that also uh, people didn't uh, cross the seas okay so they uh, indians or hindus mainly just uh, focus on trade but they didn't carry their knowledge or they didn't try to uh, spread their uh, culture or uh, their knowledge through the uh, sea uh, route okay so that's the that's a barrier for the hindu kings or but again i can say hindu kings was mo- uh, mostly engaged in trade Uh, obviously and in the time uh, during the period of uh, satvahanas during the period of cholas our economic uh, prosperity was on height okay so obviously we were there in the maritime activities not like apart from it okay. after these hindu kingdoms i just uh, hindu kings i will move on to the to our next period uh, muslim period okay so muslim period in this period uh, we will see how the arabs how the arab invaders engaged in the maritime activities like uh, slow in the overall this from right from the indus valley civilization to the to now or current uh, period the maritime activities has changed a lot of in uh, has changed a lot like uh, ship building techniques of ship building has changed then uh, obviously uh, the size the making of ships all things were changed uh, if we can see uh, in ancient period uh, hindus or hindu kings were um, engaged in trade but in muslim period there was another type or there uh, there was another thing had happened okay so the indian ocean trading activities between 5th and 13th century ce were carried out by merchants so obviously before the arab invaders before the arab invaders there was a uh, arab traders or persian traders was coming for the trade purposes so uh, in this uh, period um, 5th and 13th century ce were carried out merchants and traders from all major civilizations of the medieval era so from the europeans to the arabs and persians from the southeast asians to the chinese even japanese and even african civilization of that period chinese travelers like uh, he fayan and uh, yuan sang they have mentioned uh, about the sea trade routes trading uh, in this uh, tra- how was the trading in the, uh, during this era they have mentioned in their literary uh, records uh, then you all know that uh, arab invaders arab invaders came from the overland route they didn't came from the sea trade route obviously overland route was uh, overland route was convenient for them so uh, they invaded india uh, from the uh, overland route from the middle of the 13th century and two centuries after that indian subcontinent was politically untied uh, untitled okay so the during the delhi sultanate most of the southern india was uh, controlled by the vijayanagar empire and smaller region kingdoms coexisted with the larger uh, empire so uh, in that period uh, just uh, some kings or some uh, ruling uh, kings were just neglect the maritime activities but um, in the middle of the 15th centuries mughals led the most dominant empire in india and according to the uh, historian michael pearson uh, so he observes that uh, during the mughal period akbar jahangir and aurangzeb viewed the ports uh, on the western coast merely as a departure points for the hajj pilgrimage 
and never considered their strategic uh, uh, potential as a naval base okay so during at initial level we can say uh, they just neglect the importance of ports uh, in, uh, because we have traditional uh, traditionally we have that main uh, port points like surat then uh, masuli patnam then cochin so these po uh, ancient ports wo were there but some uh, because of some neglection of these rulers uh, they didn't uh, understand the importance of these ports like how these ports are e uh, uh, important to uh, increase our economy okay so at initial uh, stages uh, akbar jahangir aurangzeb they just considered these uh, western ports uh, only uh, important for the travel or their for traveling and to just departure point of the uh, for the hajj pilgrimage okay so however after these sultan period and all akbar you uh, you must have heard uh, about akbar he was uh, uh, very uh, very uh, what i experimental in uh, many kind of things he just uh, he introduced many uh, new architectures he introduced dini lai introduced uh, what uh, revenue system was okay so again in admirability in admirability in the war uh, defense force again he did experiments okay which we can see later um so however akbar did maintain a mid sized navy and aurangzeb ma maintained naval presence on both the coast during their uh, during his reign okay so aurangzeb also bowed the loyalty of the siddis okay at that time siddhis were there too so these uh, activities are um, simultaneously going on okay siddhis were on the western coast uh, then akbar was on the uh, akbar was trying to just make uh, south uh, sorry surat uh, as a main economic uh, port to just gain some economic uh, profit naval activities under akbar so akbar was experimental uh, so what he did after the consolidation of the mughal power akbar seems to have organized an imperial navy okay so um, uh, navy was a kind of uh, was there was a part of the uh, his force hmm. so with the establishment of an office called mir bahari so he that department was known as mir bahari okay and mir bahari which could be interpreted as the admir admiralty or navy headquarters it's a again defense force um a separate defense force which we can call it as a which named as mir bahari so this uh, department had three objectives supply of ships and boats again uh, obviously ships and boats uh for the trade purposes or any other for voyages and all okay then second purpose was supply of efficient seamen uh so seamen uh, there on ship there was a nakuda nakuda is a, again persian term so in english we can call it as a commander or commander of that ship who is sailing through that boat or to that ship okay then uh, mulim was a captain of that ship then bhandari means a store in charge so these were the main uh, these were the main men or these were the force we can say were there on the ships while carrying or while just traveling through the sea then imposition and remission of activities like imposition means application obviously so uh, what activities should uh, we should apply or what activities we should not apply uh, the decision of that uh, this decision making was up to the mir bahari department then obviously a uh, remission of or any cancellation uh, with with some of the reasons or with some reasons or uh, we should uh, we have to cancel the trips or we should uh, cancel the voyages so these uh, 
these uh, decisions of imposition and remuneration were up to the uh, this department mir bahari so the during this period arabs had already established a monopoly over the indian uh, ocean trade so obviously they had their monopoly on the indian ocean trade okay so let's move on to the next slide navy navy is a kind of a defense uh, system or defense force in any uh, for uh, any war uh, structure so uh, in the mughal period mughal admiralty uh, so these four things navy needs or navy requires these four things uh, of uh, for example sea or big rivers then convenient port obviously i mentioned port and harbor these two terms these two words we can use these uh, two terms interchangeably okay so port basically again i can say where ships come ships ship stops and uh, other uh, even from that ships the uh, traders merchants can just come there and uh, in uh, just do their activities of import and export so port and harbor these two terms are interchangeable hmm. and fourth thing is seafaring people so what are who are the seafaring people so seafaring groups were there or seafaring uh, people means the activities uh, who carries the activities of sea trade uh they they have the knowledge of uh, fishing they have the knowledge of navigation they have the knowledge of ship building and ship breaking then uh net weaving also so these may uh, mainly the seafaring people are uh, there on the coastline uh, in maharashtra there are uh, many uh, seafaring groups i can say like uh, and you know these uh, uh, seafaring group but we just neglect these people um like kolis we have in maharashtra okay so this uh, comes under the seafaring groups so on west coast of india uh, in maharashtra we can say kolis are there then uh, bhandaris are there then uh, gabits are there uh in maratha navy these also uh, these seafaring groups were there okay so uh, shivaji appointed this uh, seafaring groups uh, in uh, his navy okay so uh, these are the seafaring people or seafaring groups uh so navy needs these four uh, four factors i can and what uh, mughal uh, admiralty or what moguls did they used these factors very very purposefully okay so even while uh, na uh, while conducting this uh, navy activities or maritime activities uh, there are uh, four regions or there for conducting these activities or seafaring and uh, these kind of things india uh, fulfilled these uh, these factors so uh, in india we have indus delta then ganges delta then brahmaputra valley then and peninsular india as i can say peninsular india uh, i have uh, mentioned uh, like india is uh, bounded with the three sides of the so the mughal used these regions uh, and for their naval activities okay even the time of the moguls they uh, introduced some uh, way, new kind of ship building then uh, they used uh, they did experiments for uh, they, they did experiments in the materials uh, while using the materials they changed the materials of uh, while building the ships okay so these seafaring arabs entered in the indian maritime sea so the arab patronage ship building yards were there so ship building yards thrived on the malabar coast uh, then uh, surat in broch uh, maldiv islands okay so the akbar had an imperial navy there was a uh, medley of river craft built in the boat building yards at hugri uh, then balasur 
these uh, hubli and all is on again in a southeast or a south southern coast of uh, india so with the coming of the portuguese so at the same time portuguese entered in the maritime activities of india okay so mughals were there they were carrying their uh, activities on the uh, in in all indian subcontinent uh, at the same time portuguese entered in the maritime scenario of india so the first one uh, first uh, were the first europeans we i can say so the portuguese were the first who discovered a direct sea route uh, to india like uh, india was there but europeans didn't know any uh, direct route or um, direct way to enter in india so uh, but uh, when we are studying the about the europeans activities of europeans and uh, activities of the mughal mughals uh, we can differentiate uh, the uh, intentions of these people like mughals were basically at initial level they just entered for the uh, they just entered to invade the india okay but initially europeans were not kind of that europeans just uh, entered uh, for the trade purposes only and then uh, slowly and steadily they engaged in the politics of india okay uh, their their greed just increased no so um, as i said before uh, portuguese were the first they discovered a direct sea route to the india so on uh, in 1947 vasco da gama vasco da vasco da gama was the first person uh, who uh, set a sail from portugal uh, to the india uh, so he rounded up to the cape of good hope and he just landed to the um, calicut now it is known as kozikode calicut was the uh, now it's on a western uh, south south coast of kerala okay so he landed uh, in calicut first time in 1497 so why did he came so the european age of discovery obviously at that time they were just uh, discovering the uh, many new things okay so the european age of discovery started with the portuguese navigators so first of all uh, henry the navigator who was a navigator uh, started a maritime school in portugal and the resulting of this technical and scientific discoveries led portugal to develop the most advanced ships so they they built or they developed their own advanced ships for the voyages for take on the voyages uh, so, um, and including the caravel so the caravel then the carack galleon are the uh, kind of are the types of ships uh, which were the portuguese used to sail okay so they used the, the these ships where for the first time in history maritime navigation was possible and voyagers founded a sea route to india via cape of good hope okay so first vasco da gama came and slowly and steadily other european powers also uh, also came to the india for uh, trade purposes okay and at the time of portuguese there were the mughals and when they entered in india okay there were the mughals there on in the north on the south uh, there was a local king called zamorin okay zamorin of calicut so first he just welcomed portu uh, uh, he welcomed um, vasco da gama and then slowly and steadily the the relations were not good between them but calic uh, zamorin of calicut uh, tried to just uh, maintain uh, the <coughs> safety of the uh, coast okay so in this period we can see uh, the indian ocean region so in the 17th century uh, there was a period of thriving economy okay the age of sail we can say uh, in this period uh, the different different powers european powers uh the portuguese the dutch and the english were constantly uh, were constantly 
jostling each other for commercial superiority and gains so the in the 16th century they uh, so first 16th century had belonged to the portuguese only so they have undisputed masters so they are they were the undisputed masters of the seas and in the 18th century uh, there was the uh, we can see the triangular uh, contest developed over the eastern trade okay so obviously they were uh, just fighting so, uh, there was a triangular con con contest between the uh, eastern trade okay so the portuguese and the dutch were the fighting then the portuguese and the english were the fighting dutch and the english were the uh, so these all these three powers were fighting just to uh, just to uh, make superiority just to be superior in the in uh, for the trade okay they just wanted to gain uh, increase their economic power in the uh, india to the trade so first portuguese okay so uh, europeans first of all just entered and they just did they, they just not entered but they initially they took up the uh, main prominent port sites in the india they choose the uh, or locate the main uh, main or prosperous port sites and they build their factories over there okay so here you can see i have shown in map that uh, factory of dutch at masudi patam uh, which is on the uh, in the like coast of bay of bengal okay and on this side your we can say uh, see the french factories were there okay so uh, portuguese also hold over the coastal areas and first of all portuguese uh, built their factories in chaul so uh, now i don't have a map which is showing a chaul but uh, chaul it's on western coast it's on a konkan coast okay so portuguese built their first factory in the chaul and then uh by the end of the 16th century the portuguese captured not only goa so see they captured goa daman diu and salsette but also vast stretches along the indian coast so the uh, new rival trading come so there were rivalry or there were enmity uh, enmity between these uh, three uh, powers uh, europe posed a big challenge with them british so after the uh, successful stories successful business stories of the portuguese a group of english so english merchants were there uh, so a group of english merchants merchant adventurers formed a company the east india company in 1599 ad and the company received a royal charter from queen elizabeth 1 on december uh, on uh, in 1600 Uh, authorizing it to trade in the east okay so subsequently uh, in 1608 east india company sent a captain william hawkins to the court of mughal emperor jahangir to secure royal patronage so obviously they are uh, entering in a new country so they have to took a royal uh, some royal patronage or they have to just something like a uh, permission kind of thing to set up their factory so uh, they got the uh, royal patronage from the uh, mughal emperor jahangir then uh, that uh, william hawkins succeeded in getting royal permit for the company to establish its factories okay so see how they uh, entered in the uh, economy or entered in this business of wool trade making okay so uh, for factories they just this company chose uh, various places on the western coast of india hmm. after establishing its factories in south and in west uh, west india the company started to focus on east india too okay uh, particularly on bengal uh, a significant province of mughal empire then here we can see dutch so the dutch were the mainly the people of holland are called the dutch then next to the portuguese dutch set their feet in india um the dutch founded their first factory here in masulipatnam 
in Andhra Pradesh in 1605 and subsequently they also established trading centers in various parts various parts of India uh, so Dutch Surat and Dutch Bengal were established in 1616 and 1627 uh, then the Dutch conquered Ceylon from the Portuguese so see they were fighting these uh, three powers were constantly fighting for uh, just like invade or just suppress other uh, power and I, I want to become a king of that this trade and I want whole economy just for me. Then the Dutch gradually became a potent force capturing Nagapatnam in Madras or uh, near Madras from the Portuguese. So Portuguese were the ruling uh, many of the uh, like Indian subcontinent uh, they were they had many factories as I said before and uh, when these other powers uh, came in this uh, scene of the trade like Dutch and uh, French and all they started to uh, again uh, sur suppress the Portuguese hmm. uh, so the economic uh, terms uh, they earned huge profit like Dutch earned huge profit through business monopolizing black paper and spices okay so they used to uh, they have a monopoly monopoly uh, in the trade or uh, trading the spices and black paper so Dutch during their stay in India tried their hands on the minting of coinages too okay so as their trade flourished they established mints uh, after after establishing factories, they also uh, formed or they also established their um, the mints at Cochin, Masulipatnam, Nagapatnam, Pondicherry, and Polikat. So Portuguese can we uh, Portuguese were on this side also. They were ruling here, Kannur, Calicut, and Cochin. Then. French. So the French were the last European people to arrive in India. Uh, the French East India Company was formed in 1664 and uh, the reign of King Louis fought, fought to trade with India. In 1668, French established their first factory hmm. so in Su at Surat and in 1669 AD established another French factory at Masulipatnam. Even they had their factory in Telichery too. Here you can see. The because of this industrial revolution and all brought its uh, these uh, European powers came to India and they made huge profits by establishing their factories and obviously uh, because of this they gain profits. Okay, at the same time, uh, this political uh, scenario was there and Mughals were not that engaged in this or they didn't took any um, interest like what are these European people are doing. Okay, so British also, I told about you the British, no? Even East India Company started the shipbuilding too. So they started the shipbuilding in Mumbai in 1735. Then uh, even that uh, colonial period, they also um, uh, in that period, these ports, Mumbai port or Surat port, it, uh, it gave huge profit to them, to this trade. Next topic. So we are done with uh, Mughals. We are done with European. So, uh, now we will see the what Marathas were doing at that time. No, so Maratha Navy. The period starts from 1664 to 1756. Uh, so Shivaji was the first who recognized uh, the threat, the threat which is coming from this coastal line. Like before him. Uh, no one has just no one gave such importance to the coastal uh, to our coastal saf safety so uh, shivaji was the first who built a fort 
full fledged uh, naval base or naval army we can say um <clears throat> so in the uh, in this time uh, siddhis uh, of janjira were there uh, on the western coast so because of the uh, siddhis of janjira uh, shivaji has realized that obviously this is a threat or these uh, enemies could uh, harm us uh, like they are not just uh, doing trade and something like that but obviously they are uh, harming or there are uh, these people are uh, trying to enter uh, enter in our indian politics so um, <clears throat> in this period um, indian maritime interest witnessed a remarkable resurgence in the late 17th century when the siddhis of janjira allied with the moguls to become a major power on the west coast and at this time uh, this led to the maratha king shivaji to create his own fleet uh, so which was commanded by able uh, at this time uh, the brave or the commandable uh, commandable commander sarkhel kanoji angre was there in this scene okay so just as the portuguese uh, so the marathas uh, sw- were the sworn enemy in the konkan uh, konkan coastal areas were the siddhis uh, originally they were from uh, ethiopia the marathas then who held into their empire while under constant attack from the moguls initially had no navy so the shivaji was the first to realize the absence of navy uh, was a strategic weakness okay so while fighting the siddhis uh, and observing the portuguese naval power on the konkan coast shivaji realized that for trade to flourish and his empire to prosper he would need an efficient system of ports and an excellent navy so uh, what he focused on then building the sea forts he uh, focused on the ship building too okay so he would need an efficient system of ports then a great believer in forts shivaji built many coastal forts in the northwestern parts of the deccan plateau he ensured sound defense of the forts by constructing the forts on hillocks overlooking the coast like he built many sea forts uh, sindhudurga vijayadurga and many more okay uh, then shivaji involved himself personally while constructing ship building centers in kallan and bivandi so here this is western coast and konkan uh, before this i have mentioned about the chaul so this is the chaul port where the portuguese built their first factory okay so this is chaul on western shivaji controlled this whole uh, western coast by building the sea forts and establishing uh, ship building factories um, and fortifying this uh, areas uh, so first of all um, he uh, established ship building centers in the kallan and bivandi area initially his warships building efforts were not taken seriously by the portuguese and the siddhi, uh, portuguese or the siddhis uh, when his ships were ready he attacked and captured ports starting with the rajapur here starting with the rajapur and dabol in 1661 obviously he took a uh, lot much time to enter in the uh, naval force but again at least he realized the threat and he entered in navy and he um, built a full fledged naval army that's why shivaji is known as the father of indian navy okay so <clears throat> the marathas uh, quickly became a sea power to be reckoned with and faced attacks with the siddhis so uh, at the same time they were uh, fighting with the siddhis the portuguese and the british uh, shivaji's most notable naval victory was when he wrested the khanderi island 
uh, i'll show you this is the island of khanderi first he captured this khanderi island in 16 uh, 79 and fortified this okay for the uh, just fortifying this uh, islands is just important to the security of the western coast okay then the maratha navy soon got stronger uh, established strong holds in the forts at uh, kolaba again i'll show you a map kolaba then sindhudurga vijayadurga ratnagiri and anjanvel for more than 40 years the marathas held both the portuguese and the british at bay single handedly uh, so all credit goes to shivaji because full fledged uh, he just uh, not just uh, engaged in ship building or uh, building factories but obviously he he did experiments he uh, uh, even he tried the Uh, different different or uh, different different types of ships which we can see uh in i'll show you in next slide uh, i have the photos of uh, how uh, the maratha ships were look like uh then they were uh, never defeated this was in a large part due to the shivaji's understanding of maritime power but uh, after him uh, only one legendary maratha navy leader challenged the portuguese and the british Uh, who was the sir khel kano ji angre i hope you have understood till this the ancient period then mughal period how the uh, activities has changed marine activities has changed i think i should stop now because it is then heavy for you because kano ji angre it's a huge part it's a he did very well in the naval power this so let you know about the uh, activities of kanoji angre and obviously there is a another part of ship building and how were the ships during the maratha period how the activities of ship building has changed over the period then ports anybody wants to ask it anything Mm. Ma'am, now, ah, uh, like, ah, uh, most of the part is remaining. Like, Kanoji Angre is there, and ah, uh, um, ports, ship building. Okay, but I cannot do that. I cannot do that. Ah, I will not do that. Let me. I cannot do that. Gurab and 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 Gurab and